Hello, everyone. As always, welcome to the Sigilant Cybersecurity Q&A. My name is Joe Murphy, and today we're going to have some fun talking cybersecurity. I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Ben Harrison. Ben, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. How's it going? It's been a busy day, but uh, yeah, glad, glad it's coming to a close here in the UK. And uh, sorry to hear that you guys have nearly a whole half day to go. <laughs> that we do. But this week has flown by for me, and I imagine the same for you. I feel like October's already almost over. We might as well be in 2021 by now. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to wake up. Yeah. Um, I, ha I had a shout out to Green Day last month, Wake Me Up When September Ends. I don't know if you heard that song, but now... You missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well... Folks, we actually uh, received a handful of questions before the start of this Q&A series. So what we're going to do is we're going to address these questions. And it looks like some of these questions actually pair up a lot with what we're hearing in the field. So Ben, I'm sure you know, um, there's a lot of acronyms in the space. So abbreviations can be left up to interpretation. You know, as a uneducated, you know, buyer um, or someone who, you know, might not be too keen with the latest and greatest in cybersecurity, or you know, may have more of a, you know, uh, just IT networking background, and has recently been asked to, you know, take ownership of the IT security cybersecurity program at their organization. You know, they they see all these acronyms. And it's just confusing, even for me, someone who's been in the space for five years, and you see more and more ones popping up. Like I, I saw a new one the other day. Um, won't dive into that too much, but I'd never heard of it before. So just don't don't ask me questions on it if you've never heard of it before. So. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was similar to this. Um, yeah. So EDR. So. A lot of folks have come to us, Ben, you know, um, asking, okay, well, what's the difference between Sigilent and the likes of, you know, your standard EDR vendor out there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the definition here I pulled from a reputable source, you know, the, the definition itself, let's read it here. So the endpoint detection and response solution EDR market is defined as solutions that record and store endpoint system level behaviors. Use various data analytic techniques to detect suspicious system behavior, provide contextual information, they block suspicious or malicious activity, and provide uh, remediation suggestions to restore affected systems. So someone reads that and they see, okay, it does it all. So that's all I need. So EDR evolved from antivirus, right? Pretty much, yeah. So, I mean, let to say, why the new acronym? Why the new name? Right, I mean, it's because it's fresh. It's, it's something new to market and something mm -hmm. that, you know, you can just position to sound intriguing and, and cutting edge and, you know, that's, it's just unfortunate that a lot of the stuff out there is is positioned in such a confusing way. Um, Something you said earlier, you talked about people who have had a background in IT or people who have a, a periphery knowledge, maybe software development, uh, engineering, technical delivery, those sorts of elements, and about when they come into the market, everything in security seems to have moved so far on and they feel a bit left behind. I'll tell you a story which I find very reassuring. Um, so the first time I heard the term microservices architecture and somebody showed me a massive picture which came from AWS and somebody started talking about it in very long acronyms, uh, very long complicated words. Um, it, took about, it took a little while, it took a couple of minutes to actually understand what they were talking about. But very, very quickly, I, I realized, oh, you're, you're talking about POSX. You're basically talking about the POSX standard. That's been around since, what, 70s? <laughs> so this ain't new, and that, that, that's the reality. And for anyone who's trying to ground themselves in this, I would give everyone, everyone who's concerned that they're getting caught up in the churn of the tide, look, just put your feet down. 
the, the, you're, the water is not that deep. Um, and a lot of these things you can equate back, and you, you've done it already with, with EDR. Is that not just antivirus? Now, I would say it's a bit more than what people would think antivirus contains, but effectively, yeah, this is just an evolution of antivirus. It does new things, but if you look at the antivirus market, they're now being rebranded as EDR solutions. It's not that they've really changed much what they're doing. They've just, it, they've just increased the boundaries. And that's something which, again, from a security perspective, way back to the start, we're saying, look, we need to keep pushing the boundaries out. I think in last week's webinar, we said that, look, in this game of cat and mouse, bad luck, we're not the cat. So we need to continue to push our defenses. And so I like, I definitely like that there's a continual push for new technologies. And I understand the need to rebrand and remarket those because otherwise uh, it gets difficult to try and sell a newer product. And th th this is a sales and marketing problem. And the problem fundamentally is if we're just selling antivirus, only it's better antivirus. How many times can we say, oh, it's better antivirus, oh, it's better again, it's better, it's fifth time better, it's 10th time better, it's the thousandth time better antivirus. Yeah, that, that, that music starts to wear a bit thin. And as a result, that the industry is driven to coming up with new ways of delivering technology and not just in terms of the capabilities of what they do, but also new ways in terms of uh, helping our customers understand the value of these things. Whenever you say antivirus, it's like, okay, so antivirus, all right, well, that's clear enough, stop the viruses. You say, yeah, but it actually does a lot more than that. You go, all right, what does it do? Uh, well, it actually protects your endpoint. Well, what does it do? Well, it detects things, viruses. Well, it does, but it also detects other things. Well, like what? Uh, like uh, Trojans, like scripts. They're not really viruses. They're, um, and also also it responds. Oh, what do you mean it responds? Well, antivirus responds. It just deletes things. It won't let me open them. It's like, yeah, but this, this can go a bit deeper. This can actually quarantine things. This can allow you as an owner of a business or an owner of a cybersecurity program to make intelligent decisions. So an awful lot on top of antivirus goes into EDR. And I expect, much like POSX versus microservices, there will be another version of EDR, which will come further on the pipe. I mean, on the acronyms front, and I haven't quite memorized this slide deck, so I hope you don't have it in the next one, but SOAR, S-O-A-R. Big question, what is this? You all right, SOAR? Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, SOAR. I mean, just the name itself. Yeah. But the reality is SOAR is an evolution it really is. It's an evolution um, of previous security type programs. Um, that's it. And it, it, it really, it, it brings together some, some enhancements that are really, really powerful from the back end, from vendors, from your security program operators. These are the people sitting in seats who are actually making your whole, your whole engine work. So it is powerful, but it's not drastically new. What is new is the way in which we have to try and deliver those messages and, and help customers understand the need for these tools. And we really just can't, well, it doesn't work to just say, we've got better security again. It's security 2020. Do you want, do you want to buy it? Um, it doesn't fly. And I understand why it doesn't fly because as much as um, the, the sales and the marketing world revolves around trust and confidence, security absolutely revolves around trust and confidence. There's a lot of parallels there. And Trust and confidence starts to wear thin whenever you can't actually demonstrate the enhancements in a clear way that people can understand. So don't be scared by acronyms. If you do a little bit of research, if you do a little bit of work, you'll find very quickly, oh, it's the new version of that old thing. And I know what that was. So I kind of understand the difference between that and this. And EDR, um, extremely important market, extremely important as to is um, putting together a program which covers all of these aspects. If you didn't have antivirus, yeah, you have a problem. If you don't have antivirus or EDR, you still have a problem. So you need, you need to get into a position where EDR is part of your overall security program. And I'm glad to see that uh, <laughs> the, the message of antivirus or the stigma of antivirus is almost being shed. And I talk about stigma. Um, if I say to you, hey, antivirus, do you want to install antivirus on your computer? Honestly, what's the first thing that jumps into your head? It's already in there. It's already installed. That is the right answer. Well done. <laughs> number, <laughs> number two, if, if, you, if you talk to the average user and you go, hey, I need to install antivirus, most people's interactions with antivirus, they, they kind of fall back to, I say, early 2000s or late, uh, late 90s, where antivirus was install it and what's the benefit? Well, now your computer's a lot slower. Yeah. <laughs> Your computer runs 30 to 40 percent. No, I don't want to run a scan right now. I'm trying to go play a game. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. You and, and you, you've used um, 
some of you, you particularly have used our new product, uh, which I don't know if we're allowed to announce yet, but uh, we have a new endpoint solution. You've used it. I have it installed. Um, I've never seen it. Same way I've never seen it. I've never actually had it do anything. It just sits there in the background. I can go in and I can look at the logs and find them and go, yeah, okay, I know what it's doing. It's protecting me. Um, I think actually, sorry, I have seen it once when it popped up and said, I don't think you want to do that. And my response was, I understand why you think that, but I know what I'm doing, so I'm going to override you. But for the an average user, no, it's doing exactly what it should. The one time in a thousand where you didn't want to do that, it had my back. Um, as I say, I knew what I was doing. I was doing some threat intelligence research, so definitely right. I should have. But the reality of the EDR solution is it's quiet. It's in the background. It doesn't take system resources the way it used to. It doesn't just chew up your CPU and slow you by 30%. So part of this market as well is moving towards, um, moving away from the stigma of the old world systems, moving away from that stigma of antivirus. It's like, oh, that's the thing that keeps popping up annoying me and slowing my computer down. Now, EDR solutions are pretty much designed to be transparent as part of a wider security program. So, never yeah, the stigma, I mean, I remember the first question that I, I would get is, you know, oh, another agent to install on all my machines. It's not. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know. We, we can talk about best of breed solutions here. So there's, you know, there's a company out there called Sentinel One. You know, mm. best of breed. Uh, is there agent? You know, is that something that would bog down a network if you know you were an end user looking to install it on, say, um. 2,000 endpoints, 2,000 devices? Absolutely not. That's kind of the core and kind of the purpose is now we need to look at computers differently to how we did 15, 20 years ago. But absolutely, uh, you refer to Sandal One. That's what I was talking about. That's the endpoint solution I have. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it once and it was doing its job. <laughs> it doesn't slow my system down. Um, my system is a, fuck, it's not It's not the most powerful machine in the world, but it, it does the job and it, it's no noticeable impact from our ED, EDR solution. And that really is the case now. I mean, uh, antivirus has moved on a lot, not just in what it's detecting, the actual architecture of it's a lot smarter, works a lot better with your existing applications, works a lot better with your operating system, gets a lot more use out of your hardware. Uh, overall helps your computer run better and faster rather than the other way around. And that, that, that's a core change. Um, so yeah, that particular vendor you mentioned, Sentinel One, uh, they are best in breed. Um, I'm particularly happy with them. But the thing I'm most happy about, to be honest, is that They've only told me that one time when I was running something. Now, I knew what I was running, and it was a security threat, um, but it was me carrying out a piece of threat research. So I, I know what I was doing. I know I was, I was intentionally trying to compromise my own, my own device um, for that purpose um, safely. And I understood the code. I knew what it was doing, and, and I'd written it, so that's fine. But in the context of outside of that, Sentinel One doesn't bug me every day with, hey, here's a file I think's wrong. Here's another thing. It's really a lot better because you're talking about uh, all the benefits you get out of cloud-connected computing you now have as part of your EDR solution. So it's not a case of, oh, I have to install antivirus updates every three weeks or every four weeks or every month. I have to buy a new version every year. It's like, no, your, your antivirus it is now getting updates pretty much live. There's, the, there's not really a release cycle. It gets updates as soon as new threats are out there, as soon as there's new hashes which are of, of, of risk. At that point, you're looking at a mass-connected network, a really, really powerful uh, threat intelligence network which helps you by helping them. So you get continual updates, you get continual improvements to your service as time goes on. Benefits of scale. Exactly. So <clears throat> in, I look, I mean... In my head, I just see this giant pie, which is like all the different pieces of a cybersecurity program that you need. So would you say that, you know, e EDR is a must have for organizations that, you know, may still be relying on a legacy antivirus tool thinking that they're getting, you know, best of breed capabilities out of that tool? Like, I, I don't know what um, enterprises would use for uh, an antivirus. I, I, I mean, if it's similar to the likes that, like a McAfee or something like that, I mean, it's gotta be night and day, right? It, it really depends. Um, there, there's, no, there's no one answer to that question. At a baseline, 
every single organization must, I say must, absolutely must have endpoint protection. You've got to have endpoint protection. Every single device has got to be protected. And I say every device, I mean, we're not just talking laptops. Phones are a particular risk as well, particularly individual phones and particularly personal devices. So every single device which has access to your data, has access to your environment, must have protection. Phones, point of sale devices, handhelds, tablets, laptops, desktops, servers, absolutely everything. Now, in terms of what form that takes, that comes down to the decision of the business and comes down to your overall security program. One of the key five elements of any security program is to know what you have. Asset discovery, knowing what's out there. Mm-hmm. EDR, EDR really can help with that because if it's part of your standard deployments, particularly if you're thinking like DevOps pipelines or fast formation, that kind of stuff, as part of your uh, build process before issuing IT equipment to staff, you by default, include your EDR solution, then every single time that wakes up, a new device comes onto your network, a new device connects to the network that you have provisioned, you get an alert saying, oh, we have five, 10 more desktops here, what are those? And at that point, you have another checkpoint on top of your asset discovery and management. Um, so knowing what you have is a big part of this. And by knowing what you have, you can then look at your risks. You can decide how you're gonna address those risks. And antivirus is an absolute staple, absolute staple as endpoint protection and as it's evolved into EDR solutions, you're not getting everything that an antivirus had, but you're also getting the response capabilities, a wider selection of it. You're getting more enhanced and more advanced features, things like user behavior analysis, uh, Mm -hmm. things like disconnected use. Antivirus didn't used to be particularly good whenever you disconnected it from its updates. EDR is significantly better. Um, You've got response capabilities. As I said, you you can not just quarantine or delete, you can now intentionally, you can from your endpoint, you can say, here's a suspicious file. It's suspicious for these reasons, but someone needs to look at it. Now, if you can imagine that on a, on a large network, let's say 10,000 hosts, and a new update comes out for a piece of bespoke software that you use, and your antivirus decides, hey, hang on, this isn't allowed. Well, at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m., whenever your staff start to come online, uh, your new piece of software, which has just had an update overnight, suddenly doesn't work. Now, in a traditional antivirus scenario, antivirus will just block it, delete it, done. That's it. Maybe you'll get an alert into into your SIEM. Um, However, fundamentally, with EDR-type products, which are connected, uh, we have a, a serious... Uh, upgrade in our capabilities because whenever your system now blocks something, it's not going to delete it. It'll say, I don't know, this looks a bit suspicious. It'll immediately send an urgent report to your SIEM and an urgent report to your SOC team. And they get it and they go, oh, hang on, what's that? And you can push these as far as also giving you more information about the file. So immediately you'll know, oh, hang on, sorry, so, so hang on, it's telling me that it's this, oh, that's our update. We just pushed it. Well, are we sure our update is clean? You can do a bit of background work and then immediately across your whole network, you can say, yeah, that's clean. Put in, put in a, a, a thing in place and uh, be sure uh, that that file doesn't get blocked going forward. So it really allows you to customize your response. And that too can be part of your, your wider security program. And if you have a security vendor like Sigilant, that's part of what we can manage for you. So effectively at three o'clock in the morning, whenever your, your morning shift is starting and they boot their devices and their devices seem to not work, uh, rather than having a couple of days or a couple of weeks to try and get that resolved, you can very quickly go, oh, right, okay, well, uh, yeah, give an exception to that. We know what it is. We're happy with that. So that all comes at the power of EDR, uh, the extra enhanced features, the above and beyond uh, traditional antivirus, which we now have. Excellent. I, lo- I love how you tied that into the, you know, the bigger picture. Um, it, it brings it back to one of my favorite quotes. If technology alone could solve the problem, it already would have. And I think this transitions very well into our next slide that I don't want to spend too much time on because I know we're coming up on the uh, half hour. But building the business case internally can be a daunting task for somebody, um, you know, who is talking to, you know, whether it be, say, say your boss gets it, but it has to go up another level to a CEO or a board of directors who, you know, don't even know how to turn their computer on, let alone, you know, understand the, the threat landscape. <clears throat> so, 
you know, knowing what you have is obviously step number one. Um, yes. Because if, if, if you can't see it, you can't protect it. So a, a couple things, Ben, and, and what you talked about with the EDR solution, like, yeah, that's a must. But um, I think in a, a, a grand, grand scheme of things, like just having those high level conversations with, you know, executives that potentially mm -hmm. just don't understand or aren't really connected or plugged in. Um, I know a big thing for IT providers, like the story that you just told about um, 9 a.m., the antivirus blocks and update, you know, there's a huge loss of potential loss of revenue to the business right there. So I think that, you know, as an industry, uh, educating, you know, decision makers on that aspect is like, it's, it's difficult. It's not really tangible. It's a lot like insurance. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're painting a, a picture of absolute worst case scenario. Um, and then these people have the mentality of if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, from, you know, just from your experience, you know, talking to friends and, and um, you know, colleagues or connections that you have in the industry, um, you know, do you have any pointers for folks who might be like fighting with this very challenge? I know one big thing for, um, you know, like CFOs or CEOs is the OPEX versus CAPEX expenditure. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not sure if, if you can provide any more insight on that, but, you know, we've seen a lot of success educating yeah. those people on that. Yeah. And it, well, it's, it, OPEX versus CAPEX, the, the best example I have of that is why, is why has Amazon succeeded so hard? Like, why has Amazon taken off so, so big in the, uh, in, in the managed uh, computing space? And that is OPEX versus CAPEX is the reason. Absolutely, that's the reason. Um, the scalability you get is sort of secondary. What really sells it is the fact that I have been many, many times in a room where I've said, right, I need $50,000 of equipment today to do this thing. And by the way, that lasts three years, best case, it lasts three years. And you've got to pay $10,000 a year in case it breaks. What? Well, if it breaks, it needs to be working again in two hours. And to get that costs $10,000 a year. You go right hand. So Sorry? Like professional services fees? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're now into 50000 plus 10000 a year, right? That's 80000 now. On the other hand, if you say, okay, so it's going to cost us uh, $2,000, $3,000 a month, right? $3,000 a month. That sounds a lot better. You know, $3,000 a month times 12, 12 months, that's 36000 a year times three. Well, you're paying more now than if you owned it. Yeah, you are, but it's an operational expense. And if something happens next week that we don't need this anymore, well, that's easier in the budget. And it's also far easier to absorb $3,000 um, every month than it is to absorb 80000 now. Yeah. And that's... That's the call. That, 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 I'm pretty sure that's the magic bullet. That is what won Amazon the whole, uh, the whole of managed services. I'm pretty sure that's it. I'm pretty sure that's what wins. And the reason that it, it's, it's become up is it, it's mostly financial. And it, it is really difficult for CFOs. Now, a bit of background in my personal history. My father's a, an accountant. So my apologies. He's a chartered accountant. He's quite specific about that. He means like a super accountant. Um, yeah. And he's... He, he, I mean, he, he's acted as uh, like CFO level, he's acted director level, financial director, U, UK companies um, across the board on the different types of services. Fingers in many pies, but that's given me some really good insight whenever I'm having conversations with him about IT. And something that came up literally two weeks ago was, can you help me with this? Yes, I can, but it's going to cost you £500 for a license for remote desktop software. What do you mean? Like, well, uh, the way you're set up, we need to pay TeamViewer five hundred pounds, like five hundred dollars, for a license to so I can help you remotely. If you don't pay that, I can't help you. 
I'm not paying that, it's too expensive. And you go, okay, right, well, now your printer doesn't work. And that's, <laughs> and that's it. So an awful lot of the confusion, like moving on to the rest of the question, an awful lot of the confusion comes from um, the global versus specific impact of technical versus financial decisions. So if, for example, you make a decision, let's say you make a decision that you're going to use low cost endpoints, really, really low cost, single screen integrated endpoint units for all of your staff. And that's what you're going to have. And they cost $1,000 each. And you make that decision way back at the start. You might not understand that, well, what that actually means is you can't upgrade them now. So whenever someone comes to sell you a piece of software that says, hey, this is software, it's going to save your business this, but you have to have a larger hard disk, you have to have more memory. You don't realize that actually, well, the decision you made two years ago to buy these lower cost endpoint units means you now can't, you don't have that option anymore. Now, that's one example. And there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of interacting examples of that. So the biggest problem with understanding technology is the sheer vast scale of interaction between different elements. That, that's it. A term I think I've chatted to you before about, and I think maybe we did a webinar on it called IT poverty. And what that term means is that 20 years ago, you could have a website and you could have email running on a server in, in your office. That, that's what everyone did. And uh, those servers, many of them have been running now for 15, 20 years. And there was no cloud services, no nothing. You just you ran Exchange on it, Windows NT4, and you ran it on a local IIS or Apache web server. So you had everything running from your site. And that, that, that was the way business operated. Um, the problem is that setup still works. It's just really, really bad. It's not managed. It's no redundancy. It's not scalable. It probably costs at this point more electricity to run than, than buying a new server. But it is possible to exist and get the same email services, get the same web services. It's possible to have all of that in that, in that model. But you might then not realize that, look, in comparison to a cloud instance, cloud-managed email, cloud file servers, cloud-based web, which has huge redundancy, uh, automatic updates, hard to breach. Uh, you've got things like UEBA, security monitoring, all of that built in. You literally don't have that anymore. And so what, what that's created is this big chasm between the cutting edge and practically speaking the same output, but very, very different costs, very different risk profiles, very, very different situation, and every single step in between those two things. So you have this huge risk profile, and this huge risk profile is, well, it's one of the things that as an MSSP or as a SaaS provider makes our job very difficult, is that we have customers right at both ends of those scales. And we, yeah. we manage and we protect customers across it. I mean, that, that's our job and that's what we do. But it makes it very challenging. It's part, part of why we try to help our customers understand. And coming back to your question, this means we spend quite a lot of time, our CSAs, um, our, our, our SOC analysts, and our other members of the business spend quite a lot of time having these conversations with customers and actually helping our customers to present the case for improved security. And it's something we're particularly good at is, is helping our customers not understand, but helping them find ways to help the rest of their business understand, whether it be from a policy perspective, a financial perspective, a capability perspective, whatever it is, we, we can help in those directions as well. And ha having someone who, uh, whenever you're trying to do a presentation to the board, showing why you need that extra OPEX or why you need your budget increased for the extra risk that you have based on new challenges, um, it's something that, that while well, we can't stand in the room with you, it's something we want to help you with. We want to give you the help and advice, and that's really the CSA role. That's part of what, what they deliver. Um, there is no magic bullet, though, and really delivering the message comes down to who you're delivering it to. There, there's no, there's no win. If, if, well, if I, if I knew it, I would have written a book and well, made, made, <laughs> made millions yeah, off. I, I, yeah, I know. <clears throat> it's, you know, every environment is a hodgepodge of different devices, right? Absolutely. So much diversity and the interactions are what makes it complex. Yep. All right. You guys, we're, we're right at the top of the half an hour. So I think, you know, Ben, I think, um, you know, what we covered here today has been absolutely incredible. Um, I think just folks to, to this slide here, I mean, if, if you are having these challenges internally, you know, in, you have yet to reach out to a, you know, a service provider such as Sigilant. I mean, don't hesitate to reach out. I mean, we can, you know, have those initial conversations, help you 
you know, scope out your project, whether, you know, you need to prioritize certain things. I mean, just listening to Ben speak, I mean, a, a lot of the, you know, the projects that you might be working on or potentially budgeting for, you know, you might hit a roadblock, you know, when you're going to have that conversation because some piece of hardware that you've had sitting in the server room for 15 years isn't going to support it, uh, right? But that thing hasn't provided any alerts or red flags so it works you know you, you don't realize it you know it all comes back to that foundation right ben yeah do the five basics well yep and everything i think for um maybe for our next topic we can dive into the the five basics sure you got me wanting to hear uh two three and four and five so all right guys We'll let you get back to the day. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day, enjoys the weekend. Hope you had fun chatting cybersecurity with us today. Uh, remember to subscribe to the Sigilant YouTube and follow us on social. Ben, as always, thank you very much. Until next time, folks. Thanks. Have a good weekend.